So today we are going to uh, have our third forms class. Uh, today's forms class is going to be on the uh, 41A MLS class, or I'm sorry, MLS form 41A. Uh, the 41A is buyer agency agreement. Uh, we are also going to cover today some company forms. Uh, we have a company uh, agency agreement form that is called the Exclusive Buyer Services Agreement. And we have a second form that goes with that that is called a Home Finding Services Commitment. Now, those of you that are here, uh, and I believe in Burien also, have a copy of each of these. So today we're going to be working off of the MLS form, and we're going to be working off of the company form as well, the two company forms, and they look like this. For those of you watching on YouTube later, uh, these will be posted soon. We'll talk about that later. They will be posted soon to the backside of our websites. So uh, why are we doing this class today? What's the relevance of today and doing uh, our, our buyer agency agreement class, forms class, right now? Yes, Susie. Does it, does it come into effect on October 1st or right something? there so there are changes with the MLS that come into effect on October 1st and those have to do with the modernization of the selling office commission rules as per the MLS the MLS so in order to fully understand that or, or get kind of a, a briefing on that the MLS put out a video uh, just recently uh, and it is an eight-minute video we're going to show that right now um, in just a second, we're going to show that video because that video will kind of help explain the relevance of this and how this fits into what it is that they've changed, the rule changes and things of that uh, sort. So um, let's go ahead and do that now. We'll go ahead and mute in here. Uh, Nolani, you can go ahead and start that video and we'll go ahead and play it in here as well. Are we good with the lights up? Lights up is fine, right? Yeah, it should be fine. All right. You want me to give it a second or just go ahead and start it? No, go ahead and start it. <laughs> <laughs> this video will review the revisions, the reason for the changes, and also answers from frequently asked questions. There are two rule revisions effective October 1st. The first will allow members and subscribers to publish the Selling Office Commission and Selling Office Commission comments field on their public IDX and VOW websites. In addition, the Selling Office Commission and Selling Office Commission comments field will be added to client reports in Matrix and also to the client portal system in Matrix. The second revision removes the requirement that each listing contain an offer of compensation to the buyer's broker. If the seller decides not to offer a selling office commission, the rule provides that the buyer and the buyer's broker can negotiate for compensation as a part of the buyer's offer. There were several reasons behind the change allowing members to publish the amount of selling office commission. First, it allows brokers to more efficiently provide buyers with additional information at the outset of the transaction. Brokers could always share the amount of the selling office commission with their clients. This change allows them to do so more efficiently. Second, the change provides for complete transparency with regard to buyer's broker compensation. Third, the revision helps consumers to make informed decisions about every component of listing, selling, and purchasing real estate. And finally, the change gives buyer's brokers an opportunity to discuss their value proposition with their buyer clients. There are several reasons behind the change to remove the requirement that the seller offer compensation to the buyer's broker in every listing. First, it allows for greater flexibility for sellers when listing property, while affording buyers and buyer's brokers a vehicle for negotiating for compensation if the seller decides to offer none in the listing. Second, the change allows member real estate firms to continue to innovate and evolve their business models to better serve consumers, both buyers and sellers alike. 
And finally, it's worth noting that sellers have always been able to determine the level of compensation they want to offer the buyer's broker for procuring a buyer. Northwest MLS will make a change to the listing agreement that relates to these rule revisions. A reference to RCW 1886-0501E2 will be added to the form. That statute provides that buyer's brokers are not required to show property for which there is no written agreement to pay compensation to the buyer's broker. The reason this will be added is because sellers in Washington State need to be aware of the legal consequences of not offering a selling office commission in the listing. The new sentence will be added in the commission paragraph just after the sentence where the seller decides the amount of compensation to offer to a selling firm. Next, there will be changes to Form 41C, which relates to the selling firm commission. This is an addendum to the purchase and sale agreement, where if there is no selling office commission offered in the listing, the form will allow the buyer and buyer's broker the opportunity to negotiate for compensation from the seller. Second, consistent with current Northwest MLS Rule 104D, the form allows the buyer and buyer's broker the opportunity to negotiate for additional compensation from the seller, where the selling office commission is less than the buyer's obligation to the broker in a buyer representation agreement. If a buyer and their broker enter into a buyer's representation agreement and the buyer agrees to compensate the broker a certain amount and the selling office commission is less than that amount, Rule 104D allows the buyer and their broker the opportunity to negotiate for additional compensation from the seller. Finally, Form 41C will allow the buyer and buyer's broker the opportunity to negotiate for compensation when buying a property that is not listed a for sale by owner property. Next, buyer representation agreements. The use of these forms may increase and may become more important with these rule revisions that are effective October 1st. Northwest MLS has always encouraged members to use these forms, and there are many good reasons, in addition to compensation, to use a buyer representation agreement. Northwest MLS will be revising Form 41A, the Buyer Agency Agreement, and Form 41B, the Buyer Representation Agreement, no agency, to make them more user-friendly. There will not be many substantive changes to the forms, but the revisions will make the forms easier to use. And now for some frequently asked questions. Do brokers need to revise or update current listing agreements on October 1st? No, if a seller signs a listing agreement before October 1st, there's no reason to update to the new form. Should the new listing agreement be used for listing signed on or after October 1st? Yes, after October 1st, brokers should use the new listing agreement. What factors did Northwest MLS consider when making these changes? Northwest MLS considered many factors, including the effect of the changes on its member real estate firms, its broker subscribers, the effect of the changes on consumers. Northwest MLS also considered three class action lawsuits that were filed against the industry earlier this year. Also discussions by the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission regarding the status of competition in real estate and including the idea of parity and that is if a consumer can walk into a brick and mortar real estate firm and get information from a broker for example, information about commissions, the consumer should also be able to go to a real estate firm website and get that same information. Finally, does Northwest MLS expect significant changes in business practices on October 1st? Generally, no. Northwest MLS expects business as usual. There may be more brokers using the buyer agency agreement, and there may be a handful of listings where the seller decides not to offer compensation to the buyer's broker, but generally speaking, Northwest MLS expects member business practices to generally remain the same. For more information on these changes, please review Northwest MLS's website where you can find Legal Bulletin 217. 
some additional frequently asked questions and answers to those questions, and you can also review the revised forms. If you have additional questions, please discuss these issues with your designated broker or branch manager. Thank you for watching this video relating to North OSMLS rules and forms revisions effective October 1st. Burian, are you back? We are back. Awesome. All right. So, um, I know, pretty dynamic speaker, right? We all wish we could spend the next 50 minutes uh, listening to him. He's phenomenal. I really enjoy it. That's the third time I've listened to that video. So, uh, uh, anyway, one of my faves. Um, at any rate, so we're not going to get into logistics of the rules change and what that means and all those things. We are going to talk, though, about the rules change in, in uh, relation to these forms, right? So what is it that the rules change is that these two kind of adjustments are going to have on the forms themselves? Well, let's look at it, okay? So uh, the, the rule change on the MLS, Rule 104D, he alluded to it there, allows the buyer and the buyer's agent to negotiate if the seller is offering a commission lower than the amount agreed in the buyer agency agreement that the buyer will pay to the buyer's broker. Okay? So, for those of you that are going to be watching this later on YouTube, stop. Stop. Watch now. Watch now. Because this might be the most important thing that we're going to cover today. Okay? I know on YouTube they kind of breeze through it a little bit, so I want to catch some attention. Um, this is where it talks about, well, what happens if somebody's offering a lower commission? Now, the MLS is now saying, hey, you can negotiate that commission if it's lower than what you have on the buyer agency agreement. That's actually something that's been uh, before you could do. But highlighting what happens if the seller does not offer a commission at all. We now have the ability to go back and negotiate a commission on behalf of our buyer with our buyer's instruction when making the offer in order to do that. But the key thing here is, uh, and you, you'll use a 41C for that. We're not going to go into the 41C uh, today, but the 41C is the document you would use to ask for the commission. That is 41C, Selling Firms Commission, is the title of that form. If they put a commission of 1% and you have a buyer agency agreement that says you get 3%, then you can negotiate. If it's listed at 1% commission, and you have no buyer agency agreement, can you negotiate the commission? No. Well, no. Okay. No, it doesn't allow for that. If it's 0%, yes. Yes, if it's 0%. But if it is less than 0%, no. Or, I'm sorry, more than 0%. If they're offering something, no, you can't. The buyer agency agreement is what enacts that ability, what makes that possible for you to do, because you have a contract with your buyer that your buyer is going to compensate you, right? So your buyer, it's in your buyer's best interest probably to get that negotiated in so that they don't have to bring the money to the table themselves, right, to compensate you the difference. Does that make sense? So the question then is, well, what if the listing office offers a $100 selling office commission, right? So it's not zero, it's $100, right? Well, to the letter of the law, that's what it's saying, that you can't do that without a buyer agency agreement. Now, could you then get a buyer agency agreement signed before making the offer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course you could. It's not relevant on when you do it before you make the offer. So if I didn't have a buyer agency agreement with a client right now, and John and I were going out and seeing houses, and I showed him a house, and he loves it, and I look and I see, oh my gosh, there's no, you know, it's a teeny tiny commission. Could I then talk to him about a buyer agency agreement and about the importance of me receiving a fair compensation, and we can agree on what that would be? We could then enter into a buyer agency agreement, and then I could do that. But the buyer agency agreement is key, and that is why we're talking about this now, before this rule goes into effect, just next week, next Tuesday, right? So, uh, 
it, it is an important uh, uh, differentiator between the two. So, should we talk about the forms? Let's talk about the forms. Since it is a forms class, let's talk about the forms. So we're going to grab the 41A. Okay, 41A is two pages. Uh, you will see at the at the top of the 41A, it's normal standard, right? You're going to put in uh, a date and uh, who it's between the company and the people uh, that it is between. Great. The first uh, line is agency. So it says firm appoints. In this case, I'm going to say John Wynn since he's right here. The selling broker to represent the buyer. This agreement creates an agency relationship with the with the selling broker and any of the firm's brokers who supervise the selling broker's performance as buyer's agent slash supervising broker. No other broker affiliated with the firm are agents of the buyer, except to the extent that the firm, in its discretion, appoints the broker to act on behalf uh, on buyer's behalf as and when needed. We're not going to dive too much into that. It, it doesn't matter. It's uh, not going to be something that we're going to work with that you're going to see happen very often. But if I had somebody designated to help a new agent or something like that, uh, maybe something like that would apply. Buyer acknowledges receipt of the pamphlet in, entitled Law of uh, Real Estate Agency. All right. So if you are having a buyer consultation, this is a great opportunity as you're going through, if you're going to utilize the MLS form, this would be a great opportunity to go in and say, hey, here's a buyer a law of agency agreement, right? As part of your buyer consultation, if you do a buyer consultation. All right. Now, <clears throat> number two, exclusive or non-exclusive. This agreement creates, and then you can choose, sole and exclusive or non-exclusive. Uh, if not checked in, it is non-exclusive agency relationship. What does that mean? Exclusive means it's just you and me. We all know this, right? Right? It's just you and me. You can't go and use other people and then you're going to buy something from somebody else. Non means, hey, yeah, you're working with me, but you're also working with her and him and whoever brings you the property first, you're probably going to work with that person, right? Mm -hmm. That is an option on the MLS form. Section number three is area. Selling broker will search for property, for real property for buyer located in the following geographical areas. If you leave it blank, it means everywhere. Well, no good. Okay, I appreciate that. So no good, however, if I am doing a buyer agency agreement, honestly, I'll probably leave it blank because, yes, there are areas maybe I shouldn't be selling. And I really probably shouldn't be selling in Vancouver, Washington. I don't know anything about what's relevant and what's happening and all the different things that make up what's going on in the real estate market in Vancouver, Washington. However, I can always refer them. Uh, I would be as open as possible to give me the most options possible in this case. But maybe you're entering into an agreement with someone and they're like, hey, we only want you to represent us if we purchase this one house. So you could put in the area an actual address and it can be specific to just that home. So this can be utilized in multiple ways like that. Again, generally you'll probably leave that blank. Section number four, firms listing slash selling brokers own listing and dual agency. If the selling broker locates a property listed by one of the firm's brokers other than the selling broker, listing broker, buyer consents to any supervising broker who also supervises the listing broker acting as a dual agent. Basically, that's just saying they're agreeing to me as your managing broker in both spaces as being a dual agent. Okay? I lost my place. Um, further, if selling broker, the buyer's broker, locates a property listed by the selling broker, so one of their own properties, their own listings, buyer consents to the selling broker and supervising broker both acting as a dual agent. Okay? So section number four of the MLS form really protects you. It says, hey, I can be a dual agent. Right? It's a good opportunity to bring that up and talk about that, but that's what that section says. They're agreeing to the managing broker being a dual agent. If you bring them to, if I were to bring my client to somebody in another space, or, uh, or you if you bring your own client. All right? Uh, number five, terms of the agreement. This agreement will expire and then blank 120 days if not filled in. My recommendation is to fill in 365 days. 
Why would we do that? We'll read in a minute that this contract is voidable by other party at any time. Okay? It really doesn't bind them to you past the last day that you're helping work with them. Okay? It binds them to the things that you've already done for them, but not the things you will do in the future because they can kill this agreement at any time. So I'm going to leave it at 365 days, and I'm going to say let's not have to worry about coming back and signing this again if for whatever reason our search takes longer than expected. It's not unreasonable. That's how I would handle that portion. Uh, so, uh, it will expire in X number of days or by prior written notice by either party. Buyer shall be under no obligation to the firm except for those obligations existing at the time of the termination. So again, that speaks to anything that has happened before, right? If I've already shown you a property and then you terminate this and then you go back and buy that property, eh -eh, right? That's, that's something because we've done work for you before within the contract. But if we terminate today, this, after, this morning, this afternoon, you go see a house with somebody else, then you can write that deal and close that deal with that person, even in that area that you had, then a, con that you had a contract with me on. Uh, write questions down. We'll, we'll get them at the end, just so we can keep a good flow. Um, number six, no warranties or representations. This is something else to protect you, okay? Firm makes no warranties or represent, uh, representations regarding the value or the suitability of any property for the buyer's purposes. Hey, we don't know for sure this is gonna work for you, right? We're just, remember, as an agent, I've said this many times, right? We always wanna be more than we probably should be, right? We wanna be the expert, we wanna know everything, we wanna get all the information, we wanna give everything, and that's not always really what we should be doing, right? We want to be an advocate, but we also are not lawyers. We're also not equipped sometimes to give information. This is, hey, we're not warranting that you that this will do everything. This property that you're looking at or want to purchase will do everything you want it to do. Okay? Buyer agrees to be responsible for making all inspections and investigations necessary to satisfy buyer as to the property's suitability and value. Makes sense. They have to do their own due diligence, right? Inspections recommended. This says right here, hey, you should probably have an inspection. Firm recommends that any offer to purchase the property would be conditioned on the buyer's inspection of the property uh, and its improvements. Firm and selling broker have no expertise on these matters and buyer is solely responsible for interviewing and selecting all inspectors. Hmm. Compensation, number eight. Buyer shall pay firm's compensation as follows, and then they give you a blank. This space is a blank. This is where you're going to write in whatever that compensation model is going to be for you and your client. Okay? Maybe different for different people in different situations. If I was just writing in one address, they had already identified the property. You know, maybe I'm, maybe it's a lower commission structure there. Whatever it is, but that's where we're going to put it in. Okay. <clears throat> Now we get to 8A and 8B, uh, which are a little confusing. They were confusing to me. Um, let me take a drink here. They're very, very, very similar. In fact, they're so similar that I went through and I blacked out all the same lines so that I could get to the meat of the difference, okay? Uh, Nalani and Burian helped me with this, and I give you a lot of credit. Thank you, Nalani. Um, so uh, first, the uh, 8A exclusive. If the parties agree to an exclusive relationship in paragraph two above, and if the buyer shall, during the course of this agreement, purchase a property located in the area, then the buyer shall pay the firm a compensation provided uh, for herein. Okay? So that just refers back to, hey, you've got to pay that compensation. If the buyer shall, within six months after the expiration or termination of this agreement, purchase a property located in that area during the term of this agreement, or uh, in that area that during the term of this agreement was one brought to the attention of the buyer by the efforts or actions of firm or through uh, uh, or through information secured directly or indirectly from or through the firm okay so basically any information they got this because of information that you brought them number two a property that buyer inquires about to firm then buyer shall pay the firm a comp the compensation provided uh, for 
within. So uh, again, number two, the property that buyer inquired about. So if the buyer brings a property to you and you give them information, they are, they are also still subject to this agreement. Now all of those same words, well, I, I'm sorry, section two has most of those same words, but section one is referring to area where section two is not referring to area. It's a subtle difference. We're not going to read uh, section, well, do you want to read it? We should read it. Yeah. Non-exclusive. If the parties agree to non-exclusive relationship in paragraph two above, then if buyer shall, during the course of, within six months after the expiration or termination of this agreement, purchase a property that, during the term of this agreement, was one, brought to the attention of the buyer by the efforts or actions of firm, or through information secured directly or indirectly from or through firm, or two, a property that buyer inquired about firm, then buyer shall pay to firm the compensation provided herein. Woo! That's pretty good, right? Not bad. Okay, so what are we saying here? Basically saying, hey, anything is brought to you by the agent that you have a signed agreement with, you are going to pay compensation on up to six months after that the end of the termination of this, if it's something that they brought to you, okay? Does that make sense? Now, um, section, let's see, uh, there's a subtle difference between the two, being that in the first portion, A, it talks about area, and in B, it doesn't talk about area. That's the difference between these two paragraphs. Why does it matter? Why does area matter? Well, for that, we're going to go to the manual for the form. In the manual for the form, on the first page, section B, it talks about exclusive versus non-exclusive. And it says, this agreement has the option for the firm and buyer to select either an exclusive or non-exclusive agency relationship. The exclusive option allows a broker to be the buyer's sole exclusive agent in a certain geographical area. So here's talking about area, right? Sole agent in an area. The exclusive option may obligate the buyer to pay a commission to firm if, during the term of the agreement, the buyer purchased a property in the agreed upon geographical area and the parties agree to compensation terms. The non-exclusive option allows buyers to use different brokers all at the same time. So you're not exclusive to the area. So that's why those read so similarly, but are slightly different, right? It, it talks to the area and your exclusivity with that buyer in that area. Cool. Let's go to page two of the buyer agency agreement, the 41A. All right, 8C is what we start with. MLS, the firm will utilize the uh, multiple listing service that MLS to locate properties and MLS rules may require the seller to compensate firm by uh, apportioning a commission between the listing firm and firm. Firm will disclose any such commissions or bonuses offered by the seller prior to preparing any offer. Buyer will be credited with any commission or bonus so payable to the firm. In the event that said commission and any bonus is less than the compensation provided in this agreement, buyer will pay the difference to the firm at the time of closing. In the event that said commission and any bonus is equal to or greater than the compensation provided by this agreement, no compensation is due to firm herein. If any, uh, if any of firm's brokers act as a dual agent, firm shall receive the listing and selling commission paid by the sellers plus any additional uh, compensation firm may have negotiated with seller. All such compensation shall be credited toward the fee specified above. What's one of the greatest things about reading forms is you read a big long paragraph full of all kinds of stuff and you're like, I don't know what it says, right? Because mm -hmm. that's a lot. It's a lot to ramble for me. It's a lot to understand and to take in. So we'll just break it down, it's very simple. This basically just says, hey, if a listing has a commission of let's say 1%, and your agreement here says that you are gonna be owed by the buyer 3%, then the buyer will utilize the 1% from the seller and will now owe you the difference, or the firm the difference. 
Okay, makes sense. If the if the listing if the agreement says that you are due two and a half percent and the listing says it's two and a half percent or three percent, doesn't matter. The buyer owes nothing. Just like most of our transactions anyway, right? They owe nothing. Does that make sense? It's a pretty simple, long paragraph to say something very simple. Number nine, VA transactions. Due to VA regulations, VA financing transactions shall be conditioned upon the full commission being paid by the seller. Hmm. Now, remember the new rule, this is not a new form. The 41A is not a new form. The new rule allows you to negotiate the commission, right? Again, it, it allows you to negotiate if there's a low commission for a higher commission if you have a buyer agency agreement. And it allows you to negotiate a commission if there is no commission at all offered by the seller. Right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Number 10, no distressed home conveyance. Buyer will not represent or assist buyer in a, I'm sorry, firm will not represent or assist buyer in a transaction that is distressed home conveyance as defined by chapter XYZ, RCW, unless otherwise agreed in writing. The distressed home conveyance is a transaction where the buyer purchases a property from a distressed home owner, as defined by. Okay? Doesn't matter what the definition is for today's purposes. This allows the distressed home owner to occupy the property and promises to convey the property back to the distressed home owner or promises the distressed home owner an interest in a portion of the proceeds from a resale of the property. This was a practice that was a little bit prevalent, I think, when as the market was kind of going bad and things of that nature, where uh, uh, different business models would be to go to somebody who was maybe behind on their taxes, mm -hmm. right? And they would come in and they'd say, hey, you can get your house to me, I'll pay your taxes and get you square, and then you sign this other legal document, and this allows you to buy the house back from me, or to get a portion if I sell it out from under you, okay? That's what this is talking about. Again, a practice you're not going to see too much right now in today's market. We haven't seen, I haven't seen too much of this, uh, or really any of it in probably a decade. But, but this is a practice that had happened. That's why it's in here. Number 11, attorney's fees. In the event of suit concerning these, this agreement, including claims pursuant to the Washington Consumer Protection Act, the prevailing party is entitled to court costs and reasonable attorney's fees. The venue of any suit shall be the county in which the property is located. Woo! All right. We just went through an interesting document. Anything in there shouting out at you as to why maybe a lot of agents don't feel comfortable trying to get buyers to sign that agreement? I wouldn't sign it. Yeah. There's a lot of things in that agreement. <laughs> However, that's what the MLS provides us uh, in order to be able to be in a position to protect ourselves as buyer's agents, okay? Um, Tom Hurdlebrink is the president and CEO of the uh, NWMLS. He has recently acknowledged uh, that they are soliciting the feedback, the MLS is soliciting the feedback of a group of 25 representatives from within the MLS. Uh, to confer with their legal counsel about feedback or concerns raised by the relevance of the 41A. So basically that's just a long way of saying, hey, they're looking into making revisions and making this a little bit more user friendly. What those changes might look like, who knows? We could probably guess at what some might be, but we really don't know. So a 41A is most likely gonna be revised sometime at a soon future date. Hey, how do you go and get the money from these people? I mean, they sign this agreement, they find a place, and the agreement's over, it's four months later, and then you find out they bought it. What, are you going to go after and sue them? Yeah, so let's do this. Write a little note, and at the end, ask me that question, we will totally take care of it. So then that way, if people want to leave without questions, they totally can. But it's a good question. Let's talk about it, for sure. Um, also... The company has a form, something that I have broadcast about this, right? So we know that the company has um, a, a buyer agency agreement. It's not one that we've used in our region, uh, but in the central region in Oregon, they use this. 
And so they've brought that in, and each of you in front of you have got a copy of this agreement. Okay? Now, for clarification, just to be specific, the MLS, uh, the, um, the CEO of the MLS has said that yes, we and other companies will be able to provide our own version of a buyer agency agreement. Okay? So this will be permitted within MLS rules. This form is not completed. It's not done. It works really well for what it was intended for, for the folks in Oregon, right? So there are some things on here that are gonna be revised. There's gonna be some things added. The management team here in our area is working with um, the legal department and, and uh, others to make sure that we have the right things in here and that some of this stuff comes out because some of this stuff doesn't pertain to us. However, I wanna read this for you because I want to go over the differences that you will see between the two agreements and why you most likely will want to use the company form in my estimation. First, at the top of the, of the form, it does say it's a legally binding contract, right? It is nice for it to be specified, for everybody to see, hey, this is legally binding, right? Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, this isn't just for fun. This, this really, like, we really kind of mean this, right? You're gonna work with me and I'm gonna work with you and this is how it's gonna go. Cool. Now, the nice thing about this one is we are starting off Instead of going into all this legal stuff and all this, you have to worry about this and you have to worry about that and you gotta give me money if this and all these other things, this goes right into value, right? This goes right into value. Uh, let's scroll it up a little bit. Duties of a broker <clears throat> shall, uh, do, uh, broker shall use best efforts to locate and bring to buyer's attention properties of interest. When instructed by the buyer or buyers, broker will help prepare, present offers on behalf of the buyer and negotiate for acceptance of such offers in accordance with buyer's instructions. Buyers shall perform or assist with the following services. And this is a list of services that we as buyers provide. Brokers. Sorry, uh, buyers, brokers provide, right? So. This gives us an opportunity to explain to the buyer what we're going to be doing for them, why it is that we get paid what we get paid, why it is that we're of great value to them, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we go into a value statement instead of a legal uh, statement with a bunch of boilerplate language. <clears throat> Next section, very similar to the 41A. Buyer. <clears throat> Excuse me, buyer understands that broker shall not be expected to render specialized professional service to the buyer, such as detailing property inspection, land use or title analysis, tax advice, environmental risk uh, evaluation, or legal services. Buyers shall be expected to engage and pay for such professional services separately. Broker shall not execute any contracts on behalf of buyer. I'm not signing anything for my buyer. Right? We all know that, right? Oh, yeah. I've seen it happen. Some veteran agents sometimes get a little, a little silly and take on a lot of legal liability. We don't sign for our buyers anything ever. Next section, agreement to hire and serve. Buyer hires broker and broker agrees to assist buyer in locating property or locating and acquire a property of interest. Firms listing selling brokers own Listing dual agency, disclosed limited agency, if selling broker locates a property listed by one of the firms, this goes into the same thing that's in the 41A, right? This is the section where it protects us in a dual agency situation and me personally, if you identify a property for the buyer that is listed by another person in our office. So you're not the dual agent as the buyer agent, but me as the managing broker is the dual agent in that situation. So we go through the exact same uh, verbiage there. And the last sentence, though, it says, buyer agrees to work exclusively with the broker upon closing. Shall pay Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Northwest Real Estate as follows. So this contract does not give an option for an unexclusive relationship. In general, I don't know a situation that I would want to have a non-exclusive relationship. So for me, this is better because then I don't have to say, well, non-exclusive means you can go date anybody you want, right? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not, but you get the idea. So in this case, this doesn't allow for that. I like that personally. Mm -hmm. 
This first box here, you have two options when you're talking about your compensation on the company form. A commission equal to X percent of the purchase price set forth in the real estate agreement reduced by any commission received by the broker from the seller or seller's broker. Again, just goes back to, hey, if it's a lower commission, you only have to bring the difference. If it's the full commission that we've agreed to in here, great, pay nothing. And then there is a section to write something in that might be more um, complicated or specific. Great, you have that option. This next section here, three lines, uh, this is coming out of this agreement. So this is something that we just know right now. It's just coming out in uh, the central region. They, they charge a fee. Different states have different rules and laws and things that they have, and that's something for the central district that will be coming out of our version. So we'll skip that. Next section is term. The term of this agreement shall begin on X date and end at 5 p.m. on X date. Again, I would do 365 days. I'd just do it a year. Either party shall have the right to cancel this agreement without penalty at any time prior to broker, prior to the time broker presents an offer on behalf to a potential seller. Okay, so this is different than the form 41A on the MLS in that it says, hey, it doesn't say just because I brought you information on a house, I'm due a commission. This says, hey, you can kill this agreement with me up until the time that I present an offer on your behalf. Okay? So this is less limiting to a buyer. Now, this is verbiage that we will probably be working on and adjusting to sound a lot more <laughs> like the MLS form. Okay? But this is what it says now. So that's what we're going to deal with now. The entire engagement, engagement is the, or agreement is the last portion. The terms of this agreement are the complete and final expression of the entire agreement between buyer and broker and cannot be altered, amended, modified, or changed except in writing signed by both buyer and broker. Okay? That is the form that we were working off of. And you can see right here it talks about the firm's license in Oregon. Clearly, again, this is not a form ready for us today. We are working on this diligently now. Ultimately, this form will be, will be amended for our use, and it will go up uh, on the MLS and transaction desk, and it will be available for you to use and utilize that way. The last page that you have in front of you, one that looks like this, Home Finding Services Commitment. Now, you're looking at that and you're thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, is Tay Series going to go read all of that? And the answer is no, I'm not going to read any of that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're not going to read this document, but this communicates more information and more value between you, the buyer's agent, and your buyer, right? This gives you options. You can check boxes that would apply to services that you are going to render to your buyer. Again, building the value and the expectation that your buyer can have of you and helping them understand that they're entering into a business relationship with you where they are going to receive significant attention and value and service. This again is a company form, a company form only. There may be slight revisions to this, I don't know yet, but at the end of the day, I believe that this form gives you a lot of value and much more ease in presenting this to your clients. And I think that that will, that will have some value as you go forward. All right, so, wow, that's a lot. We've been through two different versions of a buyer agency agreement, right? So, why haven't, been buyers, uh, why haven't agents been using this agreement? The 41A, let's say, because we didn't even know the other one existed until right now. Why are agents in the MLS not using buyer agency agreements? Sounds a bit grim <clears throat> to uh, buy it. Sounds grim. Maybe you aren't comfortable with it, right? Maybe we're not comfortable presenting it or explaining it, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. Why would they sign it? Why would they sign it, right? Why would they sign it? Well, if they want to work with me, if they want my time and effort and energy, mm -hmm. then they're going to need to sign that, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, why would they? Um, why should they use it? Why do we need to be using it? We talked about this a little bit earlier, right? Why do we have to be using it? Compensating us fairly. Because it allows us to do some things if the buyer, or I'm sorry, if the seller is not compensating us in a manner that we feel is 
fair for our expertise and knowledge? Absolutely. Absolutely. Why else would we want to use a buyer agency agreement? The negotiators with the buyer isn't uh, liable for the commission. To negotiate so the buyer isn't liable for the commission? Absolutely. Also, reasons that we would want a buyer agency signed, agreement signed, is it protects us as an agent. We all have clients right now, buyers, that are out there looking at open houses without us. They are. We're sending them listings and we're showing them houses, but they're still out there looking at open houses without us. They're not even telling us because they don't want to waste our time, right? Because they care about us. And they also know that they're just, hey, oh, I don't know. I told them West Seattle, only West Seattle. But then we saw this house in Seahurst, and it's a craftsman, and I could never buy that in West Seattle for that price. It's open tomorrow. Let's go check it out. We will not bug, uh, you know, Jeff. Let's not bug Jeff. Let's just go take a look at it because we don't like it, and we don't want it, right? But the next thing you know, Jeff goes to the open house, and as I say in the open house class, he sees somebody like myself, who's more than happy to steal him as a client, and next thing you know, you're getting that call from your client saying, hey, hey we bought, a house. bought a house, not with you, right? This prevents that. This says, hey, great, you bought a house, congratulations, how would you like to send the money, right? So I've been working with you, I've been serving you, I've been doing all these things. That will never happen when you have a buyer agency agreement signed because you'll have the opportunity to explain what that is. So that snarky comment or conversation really would never happen because you have the opportunity to sit with your buyers and say, uh, today we're signing an agency agreement. This is what I am committing to you and this is what you're committing to me, right? So you have a chance to talk about that scenario. If you were to successfully enter into this agreement, <laughs> your clients would now be on your team though. They would be looking at the commission offered by the seller. If you, okay, so Jeff says, if you successfully got this completed and signed, that it would it would create maybe more of a team uh, mentality between you, the agent, and the buyers, and, and they would understand your value, and if they saw a lower commission, they might react in, in, a, in a way that would be beneficial to you. And, the, and, and that's right, that's what I think absolutely will start happening with this. The MLS is trying to bring transparency. That's what the changes are about. Transparency, transparency, transparency. Through transparency, we have created expectations. And when we have specific expectations that have been created, if we, if we can share with them what to expect before it comes, it will be easier once it comes to deal with said expectation or said issue or item or thing, right? So the whole idea behind this is, hey, let's have the conversation up front. Let's have them see what my value is and explain that there are business models out there that curb the compensation for all of this value that I am bringing. And so if you would like to work with an agent that brings all of this value, this, this would be something that you would want to do. Now we're not going to get into today in this class best practices for getting this accomplished. Talking points, things like that. We don't have time for that today in this class. Uh, I would like to do a lunch and learn kind of a situation, a little workshop maybe. Uh, in each space to talk about different ways and talking points and things of that nature. But today we're just not going to have the time to do that. You're right though, Jeff. This does give an opportunity for us to be on the same page because they're going to be seeing the Selling Office Commission. Selling Office Commission, as the different websites adjust to this change, I mean, Northwest MLS is the first one to make this change, but as they adapt to this, you will start seeing Selling Office Commission on all the main uh, uh, the websites, Zillow's and Renfins and you know wherever else, Berkshire Hathaway's website, things of that nature. And yes. will that happen automatically? So, um, Windermere.com or something like that takes the information from the MLS, and now that MLS will include the SOC. So Bruce says, is that going to happen automatically? And the answer with other you know, other companies going to scrape that information? And the answer to that is. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. We'll see when we pull the plug on day one, right? And we go, now this is what's there. Uh, I would imagine it may take some time for this to really get up and working in the way that the MLS intends. Sure, if they go to the MLS website, MLS uh, for the public website, they'll be able to see that because the MLS is making this adjustment. But again, one MLS in the entire country. And my guess is when they scrape that information that right now, those websites may not have a spot on their website 
to, to uh, broadcast or to show or display that information, right? And so I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know how much selling office commission information is really going to be out there day one. But I guarantee you, this is going to continue to happen. And if you came to the, to the, the um, class that we did a while back, uh, there was a couple hours on what's kind of happening right now, and you, and you learned about the lawsuits and things that are happening, guaranteed this is going to continue to roll, and more MLSs are going to implement it. And so the websites will catch up if they haven't already uh, come up with a solution for day one. But I don't know that. I don't know that. Before we get to questions, one last thing I do want to mention about this is one thing that I think people are concerned about when it comes to the getting a buyer agency agreed is now we're actually asking the buyers to pay our commission. Whereas before, if you did, it's free, right? That's what we tell our buyers. You, I cost you nothing, okay? But what we have to remember and the perception that we have got to put our heads in now, because that was a good selling point. I'm free to you. But was that really true? No, not really. No, no, it wasn't true at all. It felt true, it seems true, but what's really happening? Mm -hmm. The seller is just turning around and giving you money that the buyer gave them. Yeah. The buyer has always paid for the representation. Mm -hmm. Just a roundabout way. This is just a more direct way of showing it, right? Mm -hmm. And saying, hey, if they are making an adjustment in their purchase price or whatever they're doing in order to pay me less, that means that their net ultimately has to come down. And so your final amount ends up being the same. We're just fine. All they're doing today, all they have been doing has been financing your commission. That's been what has been happening. Now we can talk reception and we can talk about whether or not how that really works and, and, and all of those things and, and that would be a great thing for another time. But that's something to remember in all of this. There's only one pool for money to come out of in a transaction and it's the pool that the buyer is bringing to the party. Does that make sense? Yes. Oh, oh yeah, so yeah, let's, let's do some questions, yeah. So you mentioned that the, previously the buyer was financing the commission. How's that structure going to look now if the buyer does pay the commission? Do they have to do it How's closing <clears throat> cost? Okay, so Severian so can hear, good to make sure, I don't know if they can or not. But um, Tamara asked, hey, okay, we'll use the concept of they've been financing the commission, but now if they actually had to bring a commission, how could they finance the commission? How could they roll that into the purchase price? And the answer to that is that they could offer more for the property and utilize the 41C to, to negotiate the commission. Does that make sense? Or they could make the offer just as it is, full price, and just say, yeah, but you're going to pay a commission because that's what we're doing. Yeah. I know Susie. Susie is about to blow up. I know. Bruce, yes? Do we know if all of the lenders will accept this concept? So I know VA buyers cannot pay for the commissions here, but is there a likelihood that other lenders might say the same thing? Yeah, Bruce is saying, well, is this going to be an issue with lenders? Possibly with appraisals and things of that nature, right? If we're increasing the price and asking for a commission back or whatever that looks like. And the answer to that is, remember, these are still in effect today. This is not brand new. This is just underutilized, right? Yeah. So these things happen today. How they're handled, I don't know. I haven't had firsthand experience seeing it. You have to remember also, what is happening today in the real estate market in terms of the number of companies that are offering 0% commission or reduced commission or whatever it is, right? The number of companies that are doing this are still gonna be the same number of companies that are doing it on October 2nd, okay? So the frequency with which you deal with this now is in all estimation going to be the same as you will when this goes in. It's not the sky is falling, it's not. Now, this is just a situation where this, it's a reminder about how a buyer agency agreement of, of either sort protects you and your commission. Mm -hmm. It reminds you that you have an opportunity to present your value and protect, and protect your commission. Yes. 
questions. We have questions in Burien. Can we unmute Burien and see if we've got questions over there? Any questions in Burien? No, no, no questions in Burien. Okay. Any more questions in the room here? Bruce, oh, I got two more here. So should we get either the Berkshire Hathaway or the 41A signed before we present the offer to the seller? Should we get it signed by the seller before we present the offer to them? Because what's to prevent them from taking our offer and negotiating with us with buyer? Well, you want a 41A. Uh, Bruce, Bruce is asking a uh, timing question of when you have things signed. You would want to have your the 41A signed before you made an offer, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Right. And could you do it at that time? Yes. Actually, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so that's when you would want to have it signed then. The 41A is not an agreement between you and a seller. You will notice on here there is no place for a seller to sign a 41A. This is not a part of your purchase and sale agreement. This is a document you will send through SkySlope to put in your file so you have it on file. But this is not something to include in your purchase and sale offer, nor is it something the seller has to sign. So you have your client sign it before, and then you have no problems. But Does that make sense? If we expect the seller to pay part of the commission and they're only offering 1% and we need 3%, for example, um, we would have that extra 2% on here. The extra 2% if you made the offer would be on the exclusive buyer agency agreement. So could you send that with your offer so that the seller could see that the, this buyer has to pay that fee? And so, hey, if you want to sell to this buyer, guess what? Somehow it's being compensated. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, you could do that. Uh, hold on. Uh, uh, Casey. Oh, right. So question about the home finding services commitment. I do like the approach of, you know, check boxes of what you're comfortable with, like, as far as, like, the services that you provide. Also just, hey, I'm providing you this much value. That sure. Sort of thing. But if I'm the buyer and then my agent checks some of the box boxes but not all of them, and I go, well, where am I supposed to find a person who will do that service? Okay, so, so that? Casey's question is, again, for Burian to make sure, on the uh, the page from the uh, from uh, the company from our company the home finding services commitment page where you can check boxes she says hey if you if you check some boxes but not all the boxes would that be a negative to the buyer yeah. it could be yeah I mean it could be again strategies and things like that those are things that you're going to want to look over yourself and determine what you want to use what you don't want to use if you want to use any of it at all the majority of agents don't use any of this at all today the two best ways to utilize a buyer agency agreement, in my estimation, the easiest ways are when you are doing a buyer consultation, when you sit down with your buyer for the first time, you go over all the properties that they're going to see, and you just sit down and simply have a discussion with them and share with them, this is what I do for you, this is what I get compensated, there's some weird business models out there that may compensate less. This is, this is what we're entering into. And you will find your own way of doing that. Um, Ann Peely, I believe is her name, uh, did a six-part uh, um, uh, video. There's six pieces to it on YouTube with Annie Fitzsimmons. She's used buyer agency agreements. She's taught buyer agency agreements. I think she's a little nervous in the video. Uh, and you will not like everything that she says. You'll listen to it and go, well, I would never say that, or I would never present that way. And of course you wouldn't, because you're you, right? Yeah. So you would never present everything the way I do it nor would I do it the way you do it. But you could watch that video if you look at Annie Fitzsimmons one-on-one um, -on -one is what it's called on the on YouTube. You can look those up. Uh, and they're, in, they're detailed. It's probably about an hour total. But you can get a perspective and a role play of how she utilizes a Form 41A. And you'll take things that you like and you'll leave things you don't. Uh, so there's some value there. You could look into that. She deals with it with the buyer in a buyer consult. If you didn't get it done up front, you could deal with it again at the time that you have your um, your client sign uh, their offer, right? Mm -hmm. Now this is a little late if they've already bought from somebody else in an open house that you weren't there for, then, then you're late to the game. Yeah. But that would protect you on that offer and anything going forward if you didn't achieve that house. So that's a couple of ways that you can put this in. Again, 
you will find your own rhythm with this. You will find your own way of explaining and sharing and showing your value and, and doing and doing this. Jennifer, you had a question. Um, just a, it was a continuation of Bruce's. On the 41A under 8 compensation, you know, we're told over and over again we are not obviously attorneys, we should keep handwriting to a minimum on mm -hmm. contracts. Do you have a prescribed statement to include here okay. under compensation? Okay, Jennifer's question is hey, on the compensation portion, number 8 on the 41A, the MLS form, it's blank. So, because we don't like to write things, if we don't have to write things, do we have verbiage that is accurate to that? And what I would say is that yes, we do actually have verbiage if you utilize for that verbiage the exclusive buyer service agreement from the company. Because remember, that is the verbiage is there a commission equal to X amount of the purchase price, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you could utilize that verbiage and put in the amount. Also, one thing that might also be a way for you to think of this abstractly is we always go to 3%. Our value is 3%, right? There's a lot of reasons for that. However, <coughs> would you show and sell a property at two and a half? Sure, we do it all the time. We don't have a lot of control over what the seller says. So do you have to put 3% as the amount that you have to be paid by a buyer's broker? No. no. You could very simply say, you know what, I'll put in 2%. Yep. And Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, oh, we can hear you over there, Nalani. Oh, sorry. We were just saying you could actually say up to 3% if you are having them sign this during a buyer consultation. Absolutely. With your client, you can have discussions. If they're really offering you two and a half, your numbers are tight. My expectation is not going to be that you bring me an additional half a percent. Absolutely. You can handle it many ways, right? You, In my estimation, the way that I would probably handle it is I'd probably put something like a 2% in there and say, look, I do deals based on how they present. I'm not interested in worrying about you paying me if it's less than I and worth or gen well, however you want to say it, doesn't matter, right? But 2% is about the lowest that we see unless we're dealing with some of these companies that are trying to cut cost, cut cost, cut cost, cut cost. And in that case, I can't represent you for 0% or for a half a percent because I can't even do it because my insurance won't allow me to do it. I'm not covered legally <coughs> because I'm not getting enough compensation. So you can make that number whatever you want, right? Because at the end of the day, Right now, the way that it is, if there's a house that your buyer wants and they're offering a 2% commission, you can't negotiate that commission if you don't have a buyer agency agreement signed, and you don't, because I know that none of you use it. So that's okay, but if that's the case, you're gonna sell it at 2% anyway, right? So why make the conversation more difficult? Does that make sense? Does that help, Jen? Yeah. Yes. Uh, boom, 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 Jeff, uh, more questions. In that same discussion, in a way of minimizing the commitment by the buyer to have, potentially have to pay more, is there a percentage of listings that offer less than the standard 3%? Jeff says, hey, is there something that we can present to our buyers to say, this percent of listings offer a lower than this amount commission? And the answer is no. no. Uh, there's no way that, that, uh, that you can go on the MLS and see percentage uh, or anything like that. And honestly, we don't want it. We don't want it for various reasons, but good question. Well, yes, Bruce. I, I think we can because the SOC has always been available to us, so we could show a buyer that the average <coughs> SOC in this area is 3%, there's a few that are 2.75 and 2.5. Okay, so Bruce says you can do that already by showing past listings and what the SOC on those listings is, and that's true. I don't want it publicized for everybody to see all the time because it makes my job more difficult when I come in as a full service broker and they see numbers that are are uh, uh, that are adjusted because 
uh, you know, realty blessings does it for half a percent, right? So I don't want those numbers. I use realty blessings because I had a bad transaction with someone from a company called Realty Blessings. It was an absolute disaster fraud company. So just in my mind, I use that. At any rate, um, but good question. Did you have another question though? You were following yes, up on that, yeah. but you had another question. In multiple listing, or yeah, in multiple offer situations, this will bring the SOC into part of that negotiation. So if there's seven offers and someone is going to do it for 2% or one and three quarters percent, because they work at XYZ, their own sure. place. <coughs> sure. Anyway, so Bruce says, hey, this is this might change the dynamic of making an offer in a multiple offer situation. And to that I say, maybe. But remember, just because they've agreed to pay you doesn't mean that you have to receive compensation. Just because they've said that they will pay you 3%, well, if there's multiple offers on the house and you want your folks to get it and they want to get it and they want to do everything the best way possible, and you're like, hey, Forget it, it's fine, I'm gonna make 1%. I'm okay with that. I'm an independent contractor, right? So that doesn't have to impact your situation in a multiple offer uh, scenario. And again, you will create your own talking points. You don't have to use this. This is not a mandatory company form. This is just an opportunity for you to protect yourself and your commission and your time and your energy and all of those things. Any other questions in this room? No. Can we go back to Burian one last time? They're on. Any other questions, Burian? Yeah, we had one quick question. To start out, are we requesting that people utilize one form or the other if they are in fact utilizing one of these? Which we're to promoting? start, which form are we saying to utilize? And I would say uh, you actually can utilize the company form even though it says Oregon, you can cross things out and whatever, probably to, on October 1st, you're going to use the 41A, most likely, right? That's most likely because that is a complete form that has established, has been established, and that's probably what you're going to use day one. Again, we're working expeditiously to put out the new form in a way, the company form, in a way that works for our region, but I don't know timing on that today. Yes, Jen. Sorry, I, met, I think I might have missed what you were saying about the 349B, but that feels like... That's yeah, right. so... That feels a little bit like we're a company. We're, company. Yeah, so uh, Jen, Jen is referring to the company form, again, in the section where it talks about uh, the buyer agrees to pay administration via 349. And remember, I mentioned earlier in that one that that portion will be coming out completely. That has something to do with what they do in Oregon in the central region. That is a fee that they incur for certain uh, uh, transactions. At any rate, that's what that is. So that's not a Washington thing. So if you wanted to use uh, the, the company form, I would, I would line that out and initial it, and then I would tell my client that portion is only for our Oregon offices. I still think you can use the company form. I really do. I mean, I had no problem doing it. If you don't mind crossing something out and explaining what that is, I really think that the company form is really great because it focuses much more on your value and what they're getting than just that, hey, here's a bunch of legal jargon and <laughs> I want more money if they're not paying me enough, right? It, it is hard to do that. Now, I will say uh, uh, and end on this. In the videos with Ann Peely and uh, Annie Fitzsimmons, I hope I got uh, the, the first name right. At any rate, in that video, towards the beginning, they're talking about the conception, or the perception, I'm sorry, of the Form 41A and how agents perceive that form. And Ann Peely says something very interesting, and I totally identify with this. And I think it's interesting because this is all about mindset, <coughs> is really what this comes down to. She says brand new agents that she trains that come into the business, she trains them to use the 41A. And guess what they do? They use, they use the 41A. Is it a perfect form? No. Does, do we love it? No, maybe not. But they use it because it's a form that they're supposed to use that protects them. And so when they start, they have that mindset and that's where they go. And their confidence in this form and what they provide carries them through. But she said, 
when veteran agents identify that the new agent is utilizing the form, the veteran agents generally say something that will make that new agent less comfortable and stop using the form. Because that, as veteran agents, we're less comfortable or we feel like we've seen more or whatever and we have our own perception and our own jaded view. So, this is going to change. Everything changing, we talk about this all the time, right? There's one certainty in this business, things are gonna change. Things today are gonna to be different a year from now, significantly, the forms are gonna change, so this is, everything's gonna change. Change your own mindset on protecting your own value and adapting to where things may be headed in the future when it comes to selling office commissions, right? Things are gonna to continue to change. Good, bad, don't know, but it's gonna change, so we need to be changing with it.